Order. Thank you. Um, can I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Durgan. Mrs. Giftos. Here. Mrs. Glidden. Here. Mr. Gill. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Ms. Culps. If you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, 4.0, tonight is a workshop. 4.1, the district progress on the CNA district and building goals as well as the ESSA project proposals for ESSA. All right, I'll kick us off tonight. Um, are we good to just speak this way? I think this will, these mics will pick up. They should. Um, I think so. Since we don't have a big crowd. <laughs> we can pass the mic down the line if we'd like. Um, so we're really excited to share with you our end of year progress update um, tonight. We are going to accomplish a couple of things. We're going to review our progress on our district goals and the um, individual specific building goals. Uh, you'll have a chance to hear from every member of the Leadership Council tonight about the work that we've been doing. Um, we're going to celebrate some of our successes and also begin to identify some next steps. This is always an exciting time of year for our school and district leaders. Although people think we're on vacation, we're not. We're actually <laughs> reflecting and um, doing some strategic planning and really thinking about how we build on the work that we, the progress we accomplished in the current year as we start to think forward to the next year. And then Monique is also going to provide an update on our Every Student Succeeds Act application. Those are our federal grant applications and you'll hear how that's going. We'll probably go ahead and present all the way through so you can hear how we have progressed as a whole leadership team um, and, and school community, and then we can ask questions, answer questions at the end. So if you want to jot as we go or whatever strategy works best for you, that'll help us stay on track and make sure that we can get through the whole presentation. Any questions about our objectives before we get started? Hearing none. Um, so you know I like to always start with our mission. And I know Kelly Crosby thinks I'm going to say we've all sat at that wobbly <laughs> table. Um, but actually, I have new props. I don't have to use the digital table anymore because now I have um, this little carpet to add to the table metal metaphor. And you know, thinking about the carpet as the community that supports our school system. And he, remember the old table, some people thought it had three legs, but in fact it had four, four legs. <laughs> Mission, vision, values, and goals. Um, my new table that I have now not only has those four legs, and yes, stable, sturdy, even, strong, it also has these connected pieces um, in the middle, which I think of that as being the leadership team, the school board, uh, the building leaders, and the work that we do to bring all of these components together is that foundation, our mission, vision, values, and goals, to make sure that we have a really sturdy foundation. And this is where, this is the work, this is where the work rests, right? On this strong foundation. And we ask ourselves as we set goals, we ask ourselves as we make decisions, does this align to our mission? Does this get us one step closer to our vision, that type of school district that we're trying to become? And does it align to our values? Is this what we say we believe in um, and what matters most? And then, of course, does it help us accomplish our goals? Um, so that's the mission, vision, values. We, we rest our work upon that. And now even, I have little chairs. <laughs> and so you can think about our students sitting around this work because really that's what it's all about, right? And I used to like to think of them on the table as well, but it makes more sense that they're around this work that we do. That's why we exist. That's our fundamental purpose. And it was good practice for our leadership team to uh, have the table. They gave Julie the table yesterday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, a little gift. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she really enjoyed her gift. <laughs> <laughs> I am getting the most out of it. I haven't even showed it to Ava yet. <laughs> 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 Um, 
And so I remind you again of our mission. We like to you know, orient ourselves around this every time we come together because what we really want to make sure is that this doesn't just become something that's on our website or something we put at the bottom of our letterhead, but that it's something that we actually live and breathe um, and believe each and every day. So I won't read it to you because I bet you all could close your eyes and recite it. Monique, Monique, would you like to? <laughs> we practiced yesterday. <laughs> and Monique had it with 99% accuracy. <laughs> and then, of course, our vision. And this, is, this really becomes our strategic plan. And this has been the strategic plan in the district for a number of years, well before I came to Scarborough. Um, we've organized it around these four themes to make it more memorable and make it more tangible so that it has meaning and value to everyone in the organization, not just the person who loves the table metaphor. Um, <coughs> And so we have our four strategic themes, and um, really some of the work that, if, if I were going to give a, a, a next step in terms of making sure this really is a strong foundation, is that values work. And really coming together as a whole community and talking about what are our beliefs. Um, we have some values that we used to be, you know, we named that as our student center vision. Um, we've rebranded that as our, as our values, but we need to check back in on that regularly, particularly um, in, a, in a community where people are coming in and out of the community on an annual basis. And so that would be one suggestion I would have to just make sure that that table is nice and strong and not wobbly. Fine now. So our first goal this year was to establish an improvement process. And the connection to this in our strategic improvement targets under the strategic theme of effective um, teaching and learning is that continuously monitoring effectiveness of student-centered decisions by examining student growth data. So what we did this year was we established a district-wide improvement process. And this really, this is a goal that's a multi-year goal. So next year, we'll be enhancing this um, improvement process. So this year, there were three key focus areas that as a leadership group and with staff, <coughs> we looked at attendance and truancy. We looked at the start times and streamlined the bus runs. And then there was the K-12 professional development redesign, which we will talk about in more detail. And I would just add, these aren't the only things that we were improving this year. But in, you know, when you're setting really smart goals, when you're setting smart goals, you want to try to be specific and hone in on some areas um, with the intention of really getting your processes down so you can scale it, and not scale it up across the district. So what we learned in next steps, so we found that, you know, our conversations were grounded in evidence. If you think about our Every Student Graduates Committee, we looked at the profiles of students. When we looked at our CNA, we looked at data and had conversations around that. And we've really seen this increase in data-driven decision-making. Um, Creating all of those data overviews made it a lot easier for people to look at data. And we really do need to collect good data in order to um, be more effective with it. And periodically check in on data to progress monitor to make sure as you're in your cycle that you're checking in. Um, timelines for improvements need to be reviewed to be project or task dependent. That, you know, when you're just looking at data, you want to make sure that you're also then having outcomes, not only analyzing it. So in our um, attendance and truancy work this year, through a lot of research that we did and looking at our attendance data, we found that we were just coding at excused or unexcused. So it's really hard to get to the root cause analysis unless we have it coded. Why are students absent? Um, at different schools, the protocols and expectations were different. And not everybody is really aware of the importance of attendance. So, well, and just to take it 
back one step um, before we talk about next steps. This was an area that we honed in on because of the, the new um, ESSA reporting expectations, and we knew that the state was supposed to begin reporting on attendance and truancy. And when we looked at our data through the comprehensive needs assessment process or the CNA process, we noticed that we had a chronic absenteeism problem. Um, in fact, it was much higher than we had anticipated. And we started making lots of assumptions about why those numbers were so high in the double digits um, at some of our phase levels. And so then what we, we knew we needed to actually study this before we even get to the improvement, right? Because you have to first understand, and that's that whole data improvement process, is looking at the data before we get right to solutionitis and trying to solve the problem. We had to deeply understand it. And so next steps, um, we started to code it this last quarter, and building secretaries did that in spreadsheets. So we'll be analyzing that next week. But for the next year, we in our Power School um, program, the coding will be in there. So we'll be able to do it through our SIS. And with student-centered communications, we learned that it's very important that your communications are student friendly, that they um, are not too harsh because you're trying to draw students into school. It needs to be a welcoming um, place to be within with the communications. And so we will be working on letters, communications, um, district wide. Can I ask a question? In the power school, when you code that, will the, the family, the student, the parent, be able to access that, the coding? They'll get, not directly, not like the grade book. It, it, it sits in that database. But we could look into generating reports and periodic reports mm -hmm. on that. So they would see excused and unexcused. Yeah, what well, we report on but. report cards are just excused and unexcused. If students are at grades 6 through 12, they could go into their, in the grade book. I don't know that we're going to be using the co new codes or just excused and unexcused. You can check with Bill on It that. just might be interesting for those who are excessively absent for the, for the family to see mm -hmm that same information and say, oh, I didn't realize it was that much, that, you know, this was causing that much of a problem. It's yeah. a great idea to include a report with the letters for the communications. Um, and, and just to illuminate the issue, when we say excuse, unexcused, basically anything is excused so long as a parent calls. But right. what we wondered was, is it excused because it's vacation? Is it excused because it's illness? Is it a school avoidance? Is, it, is there some other chronic problem um, or concern that we could be intervening? or supporting the family better. Thank you. Yeah, so we will, we will be digging into the data to really try to identify those root causes. So start times. Um, I think we're all aware of why we would be studying start times, but just for those who might be picking up just now, um, we did implement uh, a new start time schedule for three out of four of our phase levels last year. Um, and more, um, and also with that, we went from two bus runs to three bus runs. So the issue that we had with three bus runs was that um, we were never able to get our K-2 students to school on time. Um, and in fact, there was even confusion around what times K-2s actually started because they, they were never able to be there on time. They are the only phase level whose start time did not change this year. Um, and so we took those three bus runs and we merged them into two bus runs. And what that has allowed us to do um, is to be more efficient. Um, our buses are fuller. That was also some um, comments we would often hear from the community is why do I see empty or half full buses, you know, driving around. So now that no one is saying that now, um, or at least I haven't heard that. So um, we're able to use our resources more efficiently with the, the two bus runs and students are arriving to school on time. Um, we started opening doors 20 minutes prior because with the two bus runs, that means you have two phase levels um, starting and ending at the exact same time and recognizing that parents can't be in two places at once. Um, we needed to have a little bit of flexibility. Um, so that um, has allowed for parent drop-off convenience. 
breakfast sales, um, we have noticed from beginning of year to mid-year that breakfast sales have increased. We're still waiting for end of year numbers to really analyze that deeply and see is it meals or is it just a la carte, um, but the numbers were trending upward um, throughout the year. And we learned that we need two morning CTE bus runs. So in the beginning of the year, the original plan before the compromise was to only go to PADS in the afternoon, um, and or I'm sorry, go to only Westbrook in the morning and then go to PADS and Westbrook in the afternoon. But with the compromise, we weren't able to do that. So we had to go to PADS both in the morning and in the afternoon, Westbrook both in the morning and afternoon. We tried it with one bus in the beginning of the year. That did not work because of just traffic. Um, both students weren't able to get to um, their sc both schools on time. We then piloted mid-year um, having two morning runs, and um, that worked out really, really well if and when we had drivers available. So well, that is definitely something we learned and are planning for next year. So next steps, we need to continue to assess as new bus stops are added due to our increased enrollment, as new um, developments come online, uh, we'll continue to study this. We also brainstormed some new ideas for K-5 coverage during that 20-minute window. Some um, schools had a hard time with like uh, ed techs being able to collaborate with their teachers or teachers being able to collaborate with each other before the school day would start because folks needed to be on duty during that time. And we want to continue to promote school breakfast. We would like to be the place where kids come for breakfast. That will really help us financially, but also ensure that all students have a balanced meal to start their day off right. Can I, can I just ask on school start times, are, are those things working well, the, the 20 minutes prior and the two runs um, versus three runs? I'll talk about the runs. I think yes. Well, we're going to go through the yeah, mm -hmm. oh, we were, oh, did I miss that? Yeah. yeah. I probably was on doubt. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, All right. We'll no hold problem. that thought. Bus runs and 20 questions. minutes. Because <laughs> I like the principals to weigh in on the 20 minutes. Oh, I remember. Write it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll hold that thought. Bus runs and 20 minutes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, on PLTs, uh, last uh, year there was a P, uh, PD redesign K-12 committee that got together and helped look at our model and so forth. And uh, along the year we surveyed uh, our staff to see what uh, they thought. And uh, some of the things that we learned that the staff valued the autonomy and the flexibility that the new design gave them. Um, Instead of doing one big celebration like we did in the past at the high school, each school did their own celebration at the end of the year, and teachers seemed to like that. And at the end of the year, 75, 79% of the staff said that the length, the late starts, was just right. What are our next steps? We are bringing the K-12 redesign team back together in August with the same facilitator that they had last year who had worked with them. Suzanne Godin, and to analyze the uh, data. Um, we are considering how to share the PLT celebrations district-wide and publicly so that we can, um, so people can see the good work that our staff has done. And um, we're going to look at the frequency of the meetings for PLT. That was something that came up that maybe we could meet a little bit more, maybe add another PLT time, but we're, we're looking at that. And so this is the uh, data that we collected as the baseline in the beginning. And as you can see at the beginning, we had 200, uh, excuse me, 124 responses. The blue identified that the time, the length of the time on Wednesdays for the blue was just right. The red was too long and uh, the gold was too short. That was the baseline in the beginning. We again, in mid-year, um, sent a survey to our staff. At that time, we had 108 responses. And it was at 71, thinking it was just right. 24.1, too short. And as um, the red got smaller, it looks like, um, for too long. At the end of the year, though, we were very pleased with the responses. 214 uh, staff responded. And 79% said that the length of time on Wednesdays was just right. <coughs> and 15% said they'd like to have a little bit more. So um, and look. That data will be shared with our PD redesign team so that we can go forward and um, discuss.
design our next year's model. And so this was just one of several questions. Yeah. Um, we chose to highlight this question because if you remember through the budget process we had talked about, should we just round those late starts up to two hours to be consistent that late starts are always two hours? Um, and there was some concern about the impact that would have on families if we did that. And so this really doesn't support the need for it either. So that can be just another affirmation um, in that decision that was made. I'm going to talk a little bit about goal number two. Goal number two for the district uh, was around organizing for collaborative work. It focuses on step one of the data-wise improvement process, and it really is preparing your organization, thank you, preparing your organization uh, to be able to manage and discuss data, draw conclusions, and take action. <clears throat> And so what we did was we established a common agenda format. Um, I think you're familiar with the common agenda format, but it's not just a common agenda format. It also includes protocols and key um, activities that need to take place during the course of a meeting in order to ensure effectiveness. So there are some common norms, but it's, there's also um, identifying the objectives, like why are we meeting, what's our purpose, what do we want to accomplish, to make sure that those meetings are valuable to all members. It also includes capturing those notes, but also checking in at the end, how this meeting go? What went well? What, could, what do we need to think about changing next time? Uh, we implemented that, and we actually we modeled that across the district, across all schools and across all sorts of different cross-phase level, within phase level uh, groups. We also conducted a data inventory. This is part of that organization piece. What assessments are you using? Where are they? What grade levels? What are they assessing? How long do they take? How much do they cost? Where does the data go? Where does the data come from? What format is it in? So we began to take a look at that across each phase level. Uh, the other piece that we worked on was a, um, a data analytics tool. One of the frustrations that we heard as we were doing the data inventory was access, the ability to access the data, but also to manipulate the data. Very often it lived in different um, places. We also needed to research a universal screener, which is a mandate we have by law in terms of assessing to identify students who may be potentially at risk in the area of literacy or mathematics. So what did we learn? We learned that meetings do need some protected time. We can't just squeeze them in here and there. We do need to protect the time in order to have conversations in and around the data. One agenda format may not meet all those needs, uh, and we need to continually reflect on that process. So we're going to revisit the agenda format. We're going to continue to provide um, meeting training and how to facilitate um, how to use that common format. Uh, we're also going to take a look at our data inventory. Um, one of the things we did was we contracted for a data analytics tools, Performance Matters, and we spent the year getting that ready, getting that launched, having the data input, and started the initial training, and we have plans moving forward um, to continue with that and rolling that out. We also researched and did identify a um, new universal screener, um, referred to as iReady. It will replace the STAR assessment. Uh, and we're getting ready to provide the training. We've got training lined up in our summer calendar. Uh, and that training isn't going to be a one and done. It is going to also be um, um, take place in October and then later on in January. And that's really about not just implementing the assessment, but what do we do with the data and how do we plan for our students? Uh, so that will be ongoing work. <clears throat> and I just went backwards. Allison Marquesi. Uh, thank you. So the third goal for the district was really built from the uh, comprehensive, comprehensive needs assessment, specifically in those bulleted items up there uh, were areas that we needed improvement in. Um, so goal three was looking, having the phases uh, spick pick a specific problem of practice um, and dive deeper into SMART goals, which they're going to report out on. But in all of these areas, we have um, done some very focused work. The social-emotional curriculum, Jessica has been um, leading up a K-5 committee, looking at um, some best practices, some uh, programs, and that's moving forward. Monique just talked about uh, the database and looking at performance matters and how that's uh, coming along. 
your, uh, the absenteeism, we spoke about that, but also part of the half time, uh, the social worker position at the high school is dedicated to um, that school avoidance component, which is connected to the truancy. Um, so we're going to hear from K-5, uh, middle school and high school now, on their specific uh, smart goals in these areas, in some of these areas. And I think, I'm not sure which one of you. So um, K-5 has a research-based guaranteed and viable literacy and mathematics curriculum that we share. So the scope and sequence is really um, smooth and clearly articulated, and we know exactly what our students are entering Wentworth with, and they know exactly what they are preparing for. So it's this really um, fantastic context and really support students. So we decided, we just finished our fifth year um, with units of study for writing. And last year, and so over the course of the year, we set a SMART goal um, around those writing outcomes for students. So you can see what the specific student-based goal was that we, that we set. Um, and it was great to collaborate K-5 um, so the student growth expectations are there, but we also, given in our plan, um, we also included time for the student narrative writing to be scored and analyzed by grade, grade alike teacher teams. And so an additional outcome of this goal was um, professional development and collaboration opportunities for staff. Um, the indicator that we used was the narrative rubric from the writing units of study, so that's a very evidence-based tool. And um, Anne, I believe, is going to talk a little bit about exactly what we did right after you look at some cute pictures of our kids doing great work in writing. So it starts in kindergarten and really builds on up through, and it's pretty remarkable the growth that they show over that short um, amount of time and what hard workers they are and the stamina that they develop. So I'm actually going to share with you what we did. Um, so we had, uh, as Kelly mentioned, the K-5 collaboration um, <clears throat> was really quite special. We, I don't know historically how often there was a K-5 goal, but we felt strongly as um, school leaders when we talked about this at the beginning of the year in August that this, um, this should be a K-5 um, emphasis. So we had professional development times together, um, which was unique, and um, all of us putting our energies into this um, actually helped to move the needle for our, for our writing scores. Um, some of the things that we did through that collaboration um, is really focus on understanding and using the rubric. Um, so when you look at a rubric, you really need to understand what the scores mean. Um, everyone needs to be on the same page, so that's what the calibration piece is about. <clears throat> um, we also um, used anchor samples, um, so teachers spent time at curriculum meetings um, at, in their teacher release time um, in, and in their professional learning teams on the Late Start Wednesdays, really going deeply into that rubric to better understand it. Um, once teachers knew where students were, um, then they can pick the most effective strategies to move them along and provide interventions for students who need that. And so towards the end of the year, we were able, our coaches really helped to develop um, an intervention document. And so that was provided to all staff and teachers and a lot of PLTs actually started to be able to use that, um, that document, which was really exciting. Some of the things that came out of this that we weren't going into it thinking were connecting these interventions to our academic support programs and the RTI process. Um, and a really fun thing that happened was the implementing of math journaling. Um, we think of math problems, but we don't think about writing about math. And so that happened in a number of classrooms. Um, and teachers were really excited to adopt that. and. Um, at Wentworth, in particular, they started to look at writing across allied arts and integrating writing in there. So it wasn't just about the rubric and it wasn't just about the scores. We really looked across um, our programming to see where could we implement more strategies and interventions with writing. It was fun. And more nice pictures of kids. <laughs> um, so. 
So the last slide here is, of course, what we learn in our next step. So the good news is, the amazing news is, is that we met our goal of 90% of students demonstrating growth. Um, most kids grew to a scale score as well, although uh, not, not as many as we would have liked, but it's, it was good to get the data, collect the data for the first time the way we did comprehensively K to 5 and really analyze it and be able to look at and see what our next steps will be based on that data. Um, the calibration and collaboration was a huge um, value to everybody. Again, it's the opportunity for K-5 to, to meet and have these opportunities is, is not all that common and, and frequent, so this was important. And it really does help to have, especially that second to third grade where they're not in the same building at all, talk and meet and, and see what the next sort of phase needs from us. Um, and. And then the writing intervention strategies was very helpful. So, so sort of an if-then document. So if a child is doing this in their writing or is not doing this in their writing, then what do we need to do to help them? So it was a very um, um, functional document and really helped. Um, and then our next steps are to um, obviously to increase, better understand how to grow a student on a scaled score um, dimension as well as just in the, the raw data and sort of the, the rubric gets a raw score and then you get a scaled score. So we really want that scaled score to go up as well. And continue the PD um, on the data informed instruction and um, grow our, our writing interventions as well. So over, the, over time, so it's, it's all good. Um, very pleased with how well our kids write and they, it's just amazing to see I, those of you with <coughs> The young children especially, you know what they come home being able to do, which is just remarkable. And, you know, it's not about the spelling being perfect. It's not about the handwriting itself being perfect. It's about getting ideas down on paper. And it's just <coughs> remarkable all the things that they can do. Great. So at the middle school, um, <clears throat> we had two goals. Um, the first <coughs> which is outlined here, was really um, a major piece of our work this past year. And so we really wanted to close the loop on the reporting and communication problem that we had identified last year at this time. And uh, the way in which we did that was through the consistent development and use of a student reporting system um, that was easily accessible to everyone. For you. So what we did, um, gosh, we did a whole lot, and as we were trying to figure out what goes on a slide, one slide, it's, it's kind of hard to distill it all down. Um, but we redesigned the reporting tool that was used for parents. Um, that ha happened in part um, because we were able to send a team of three people to Power School University last summer to do some research about um, how could we build a tool that more accurately reflected what we wanted it to. And so that was um, a really great use of uh, professional development. Uh, we also convened a, a wide um, body of representative folks from the middle school to create a reporting and scoring guide that was used um, with our teachers. It was shared with students and it was also sent out to all families so that it really became here's how we do business with grading and reporting at the middle school. We provided updated training in PowerSchool for all teachers in um, that cross over to the zero to 100 grading system and then also provided on an ongoing basis support for teachers in Power Teacher Pro and in Google Classroom so that as the year was unfolding and you know we were getting ready for that first quarter report card, like what were the things that we needed to check in and so on and so forth. And so that was ongoing. And then um, finally, um, a step that we had done more at the beginning, but we did do a big um, rollout in terms of the grading guide and overview meeting for parents um, and then made all of that information available on our school website as well. So again, really just trying to be as transparent and bringing everybody along as much as we could. Um, this spring, we solicited feedback again from parents, students, and staff 
in a very similar way to we had done last year. And a couple of the key questions that we wanted to find out um, around, were around, um, was the new grading system more easily understood? And you can see um, across all of our stakeholders, um, it definitely seemed that way. That parent percentage, um, when we did the parent survey, we, um, that was not a question that obviously our sixth grade parents answered because they wouldn't have had that comparison, right? So um, we sent out one survey for seventh and eighth grade parents who could draw a comparison to our previous system and then a different one for our sixth grade parents. Um, but you can see overwhelmingly parents, um, students, and staff felt like the new grading system was more easily understood. And in a similar fashion, um, folks really felt strongly that the new grading system better communicated what students knew and were able to do. Um, those were the goals that we had outlined at the beginning of that transformation. And so it was really reaffirming to see that um, those efforts kind of met what our outlined goals were. In addition to that, there were some overall survey themes across all of the surveys. Um, and I've kind of outlined them here. Um, again, like the data from um, some of the statistical questions showed, um, some of the, na the narrative feedback themes also reinforced that the current, our new system is more clear and understandable. Um, across all groups, people felt like students, um, their perception was that students were mo more motivated with the system that we're now using. That was a big um, question last year when we had done the original surveys. And so the perceptions across all stakeholders is that that is improved. Um, it was interesting to us that we had a much lower response rate this year. Last year we had 53% of parents. This year we had 17%. I have my own wonderings about that. I think when people aren't happy, we hear from them a lot. When people are feeling super satisfied, we hear from them much, um, much less frequently. Um, so we can, you know, take that as a potential um, answer to that question. Um, the narrative comments also indicated that um, both parents and students would benefit from more training on how to use PowerSchool, how to read that. And so we're really doing some thinking in, you know, other than a back to school meeting where we're taking you through that. What are some other modules that we might create? Like whether those be like little video snippets that we could have online. Like, are you looking to know how to do this? Click here um, so that it wouldn't be maybe as overwhelming as a one shot parent meeting or perhaps we have more meetings. I know people like to have lots of different ways to receive information. We also had some wonders um, specifically from our staff surveys about setting limits on retakes or reassessments, um, and also some wonders in regards to um, that crossover, because if you remember, our new system kind of marries um, standards with the zero to 100, and um, we had followed um, something that had been previously in place that exceeds was 97 to 100, and we got some feedback this year that perhaps that is too rigorous and difficult for um, students to achieve. So that um, was another wonder that came out. So overall, um, we learned that this was an extremely positive change for the middle school. Um, that was super consistent by all of our groups. And um, I would also definitely add the value of taking all of that stakeholder feedback into account in a really thoughtful process. Um, that was a big plus. Our next steps, again, we're just um, refining the reporting guide with a little bit, a few tweaks based on some of those wonders on the previous slide. Um, we're considering specifically amending some of the reassessment guidelines and exceeds percentages and looking to create more opportunities to educate parents and students. So we're feeling like um, everybody really dug in deeply. There were efforts on every person's part, um, but we're really feeling like it was time well spent. 
Our other, um, our second goal was really around, um, we have been working for a couple of years on um, making sure that our curriculum units reflected what was happening in our classrooms. And so um, in regards to that, this past year, our uh, teachers really focused on ensuring that curriculum units had consistent criteria of multiple pathways, and specifically really starting to look at making sure that those exceeds components or opportunities were built into assessments. Um, I think historically, and not just um, here in Scarborough, right, but as uh, educators look to figure out how do I show that a student exceeds a standard. Um, I think historically people have said, well, we'll give them something extra to do over here. Or maybe if you answer number 10, um, you know, and you're willing to do that, that might help to show that. And, and we're really trying to reframe the thinking on that and embedding that into assessments so that it kind of doesn't become a student choice whether or not you want to try to exceed. And so, um, our content area groups really focus their efforts in re-examining those existing unit templates and learning goals and really focused on setting progression scales. I can give you a great example. So um, our eighth grade science teachers, as they were taking a look at curriculum this year and wanting to have multiple pathways, um, at the start of the year, they were realigning all of their assessments and they came up with kind of three different levels of assessments, right? That would, that would get at the same information, but then, you know, perhaps the, you know, number three assessment was really for the high flyers who were exceeding the standards and the number one assessment was a more basic level entry. And so the teacher said, we're gonna have these three assessment types available and we're gonna let the kids self-select which one they think is the match for them. Well, guess what they found out? What they found out was that, believe it or not, 13 and 14 year olds are not always going to push themselves <laughs> to the furthest limit. Hmm. And so as they continued to redevelop those, what they said was, hmm, what we found out was, um, we need to have more say in that process and we'll decide who needs some differentiated assessments more so. Um, and, and, they, and they made that transition about halfway through the year and they really found that um, students were, they were getting a better read on what students' abilities were because the students who might not have been selecting a more difficult assessment were really rising to the occasion and showing that they had that learning. Um, but it was also great to see that there was some differentiation available so that even um, students who were really at the place where they were focusing on entry level learning goals could still demonstrate and feel successful about the work that they were doing. So our next steps in terms of that goal is really to continue that thinking around expanding the number of pathways that are available to our students. Um, because at the end of the day, we really want to make sure that there's this <laughs> equity of opportunity for students to be able to help us to show what they know and are able to do in regards to assessment. Okay, um, our, the high school uh, people had other, some other commitments, and so um, Mike should be here, but he was involved with interviews, so <clears throat> I said I would start off until he could get here. So at the high school, um, the goal this year was to look at their curriculum work and uh, their curriculum doc documents um, to be written in a format that would include unit descriptions, standards, and learning goals, and, um, and that was one of the recommendations from the ASK. Um, they were working towards this in their groups, their monthly department meetings, their teacher design team. Time was devoted to completing this work and having conversations and collaborating with that. And I think that um, it was a valuable time for them to be able to do this. And what they learned um, from, their, from their work is that um, to allow they learned that they need to start off right from the beginning because it gives them, allows them to have a whole year to complete this work. Some of the things, they had other things to do or they waited a couple, a month or so, and so this will give them 
This is what they learned that we should start right from the beginning. Um, the use of department meetings and teacher de design time has been the efficient use of time working towards these goals and that was very valuable. The ability to collaborate with uh, core select teachers has been um, effective in that meaning that they tried this year to have some teachers have common prep time together so that during the day they could meet and discuss things and teach and design in their uh, department meetings. So it gave more of a collaboration approach to um, at the high school. The next steps um, by 2020, um, next, next June, um, that they will have uh, learning targets, uh, guiding principles will be added to their unit plans. They were key themes that they are looking at and still doing that collaboration. And then the following year, their plan is to have instructional strategies and assessment practices that will include specific cr criteria that can be measured uh, for their plans. But it's, it's a lot of work, and um, this was the beginning of their work, of the collaborative work to be done with course alike teachers, with department meetings, and so forth, and putting that structure in where everyone was to participate. If I could add a little bit, yep. I just spent today with K-12 social studies and yesterday with K-12 science, and as we were working within the curriculum guide, the links to all of the courses at the high school are there with unit maps and course calendars, and all of the unit maps aren't filled out because what the high school decided to do is do it methodically, so they have all of stage one completed for all of their courses at the high school and then they're going to be working they set it out as a three-year goal to complete those units by the end of three years so next year um, they're going to continue on and work on those essential questions and pieces but they have managed across about 700 courses at the high school that we offer um, to get that work completed this year which is pretty significant work so grading and reporting um, there's the man of the hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, by the end of this year, the high school um, looked at their goal two, which was grading and reporting, and um, will complete the improvement cycle with a focus on grading and, and reporting. That was their goal for goal two. And what did they do? They create, there was a, created a new policy on grading and reporting that was developed by an improvement process, uh, surveyed students, staff, and parents. Great school partners helped with some small group discussions. Um, departments worked on best practices as a department, and letters were sent to students, families, and school board um, June 10th, 2019. So I think it was a collaborative approach in looking at that, getting information, getting feedback, getting, and I know that through this year, um, Monique, Kathy, Julie, um, Allison, and myself met with um, the um, ILT group once a month, and I've um, had some of those discussions along the way. So what did we learn? Um, there was overwhelming support for a credit-based diploma. Create a diploma that was accessible to all uh, students. 24 credits went to 22 credits, made it um, more manageable. Um, look at multiple pathways and opportunities to demonstrate uh, achievement and guiding principles embedded in each course and credit recovery options. I think that, for me, is an important piece in that having those options built into a class uh, was important. Um, and the next steps, implementation of the new policy, student support services will monitor the progress, and every student that graduates committee will monitor the progress also. I think that committee has some work to do in getting um, uh, student advocacy people um, involved with them. They're starting to, they're like a beginning, but I think in going forward that that needs to um, probably have more work in getting that done. And, I think I'm up to bat. Yep, Mike, you're did next. Did you want to add anything? Um, those tabs, um, to go back a few. Um, those are some examples if you want to click on one real quick. Um, no. Um, these were when they were working on some of the things they were working on. These were examples of some of the things that they agreed on as a department that they would do. These just different examples. These were um, as a whole high school, uh, some of the things they talked about. 
And then if you go back, I can go back a few slides. There was another. Click on, I'll just show you real quick. You keep the, going the back. The courses. Keep going. Um, right there. That was an example of like the, um, the this is, for example, the Spanish um, worked on, this is their plan for delivering their curriculum through units for the course of the year. So if you click on, for example, unit one, um, that will break down their individual unit plan with their learning outcomes. And if you scan down that a bit, it will show that as they go through their year two, they'll put in, you know, their different key learnings and, um, and, and their plan as they go through. So each of, that's an example of what each of the departments worked on too, to, to break down um, their different unit plans for the, for the year. And for those of you that are on the curriculum committee, or actually all of you saw the curriculum guide and linked mm -hmm. in your presentation, so that this is like plugging away at some of those. Sorry, I apologize for being late. We're finishing up some interviews. So one of the pieces, as I spoke to you before, was around the title funds. The federal government provides state provides states monies um, to distribute to the schools, and the way in which they organize those federal funds are around titles, what are called titles. Title One or Title One A, which is really focused on improving the academic achievement um, for disadvantaged youth. Um, we receive funding there. Next year, our allocation is about one hundred thirty-one thousand dollars. Title Two, we receive funding. Um, and that really is targeted toward professional development, but also in terms of preparing, training, recruiting high quality teachers and school leaders. Uh, the other title in which we qualify is Title IV, 21st Century Schools. A portion of that may be allocated towards well-rounded education, which is a whole potpourri of different um, types of experiences we can provide to students. But then also safe and healthy schools um, is another piece of that. Um, we allocate our funding towards um, those focus areas that Allison spoke of at the beginning. And the purpose of these funds is not to supplant what local funding provides, but really to be supplemental in addition to. So we have some restrictions around some of those funds. For Title I-A, we have to provide services for neglected homeless students. There's a family and parent engagement requirement there. And then we also have to provide equitable services for eligible private schools. And so Morrison Center is the private school who qualifies for some funding in around those um, pieces. Although they don't think they have funding for Title I this year, they do qualify for Title II and Title IV for a portion of our funding. And we meet with the Morrison Center and coordinate that. Um, this year, as a result of our free and reduced lunch numbers from our April 1st count, the Wentworth School will receive the Title I funding and looking at our focus areas and our data in and around um, writing, um, we decided to focus on writing and social emotional learning. So at this point we are proposing in our grant application the funding of a 1.0 FTE writing support teacher to um, add to the literacy support staff at Wentworth so that this person would focus on improving um, student writing in the school. Um, so for those students who are struggling in writing, they would receive services from this staff person. In terms of social emotional learning, we're looking at a support staff position, an Ed Tech 3 position, who can help out with some of those students and work with some of our students who are on um, learning plans in the area, social emotional um, area. It could be behavior plans, it could be all sorts of things as those kiddos are um, um, working on improving some of those skills. <clears throat> Title II A, we're going to allocate that towards um, <clears throat> a leadership academy. That is that opportunity that the Greater Sebago Alliance um, has provided us. And with the successful referendum, we get to continue to play with those districts um, and get, um, while this will cost some money, it won't cost the full price because of that shared services model. So some of this money, it will be about $13,000 is our total allocation for this year. 
Um, some of that will go towards supporting the Leadership Academy. The other pieces will go to provide professional development for our teachers and staff in the area of social emotional learning. <clears throat> Uh, also, as Title IV in this area, um, we um, uh, are de have decided and I've coordinated with the Morrison Center to put the funds in that category called Safe and Healthy Students, which will help support professional development and some supplies if we need supplies um, for social emotional learning. What that looks like, um, we're using the CASEL framework, the graphic is there on the right, that looks like our students' ability to be self-aware of their emotions and their actions, but also to self-manage themselves. It also includes social awareness, as well as working on relationship skills and being a responsible decision maker in our schools. Uh, so it will mostly professional develop, the bulk of that money will be professional development, um, but also some curriculum materials, but it can also support some special services. Um, like this year, the title funds went to bring Dr. Brooks into the district to provide that for staff. That's the plan for the ESSA funds. Do you, do you take lots of notes for questions? Because we are now available for questions. I have a couple. Um, I, I appreciate what you guys said when you were talking about the chronic absenteeism issue. And I think Julie was talking about um, the communication home and the templates that you guys are developing to be sensitive of that because obviously we don't want to shame kids we're trying to get to school do a letter and shame the parents and it's usually very significant barriers for why they might be not coming to school so I really love that that's part of part of that work um, and I, I just also wondered I didn't know what our our philosophy was district-wide in terms of site visits I didn't know if we did site visits to homes and if, if we did if you guys could talk about that and and the success success of that or the challenges with that? I can speak a little bit. Um, definitely, I think I'm aware of all schools have done a handful of home visits. Sometimes they, it's the school social worker and the resource officer might go together. Um, one of the major roles of the new social work position will be to be going into the home to do that assessment, to develop that plan, to re-engage that student, um, to do that more purposeful and focused. And I think one of the important things about the data, though, is that um, not all the absenteeism is kids who are sick or choosing to miss school for, you know, they don't want to be there, school avoidance, anxiety, things like that. A lot of it, especially um, out of my school in particular, are long-term family trips to very far away places where it costs a lot of money to get there, and you, you don't go for a week, you go for two months, and trying to plan that around vacation times and school when you're not in school is challenging, so, right. And sometimes a site visit looks more like that a student has missed the bus and doesn't have um, transportation and that there's a chronic absenteeism challenge um, with the family. So, um, you know, we're doing what it takes to get that kiddo to school. So if that means sending the D.A.R.E. van with a friendly, familiar face mm -hmm. from school to bring them on in, that's also an opportunity to just make that connection and you know, it's, we really, really want you here. Come on, get to school. Yep, we can get breakfast when we get there. So um, we do a fair bit of that mm -hmm. as well. That's great. I appreciate your comment about the reasons why students are out, and I think that's where the coding, you being able to use PowerSchool to do right. that. So if it's a medically excused absence, you can mm -hmm. say that and try to start to define, if it's a family trip, you can say that. If it's a college tour, you can say that. Mm -hmm. To try to define those reasons more succinctly, I think would be very helpful. I think one of the big learnings for us as a team was um, really studying why attendance matters and realizing that although it might be something really valuable like a family trip, we think there's lots of um, great learning outcomes that occur from that. And But understanding that, that not only is it about that one individual student, but chronic, if a student's chronically absent, the impact that can have on their peers in the classroom culture because of if Mike's out one week and I'm out a separate week and then Kathy's out and you never have full attendance, it's really hard to build that, that culture and that rapport in the classroom. For the students that are out for the extended trips, and I'm thinking of the folks like, that I work with that will go for six to eight weeks and they're going home, 
are the students sent with work to do so that they're keeping up, or do they fall that far behind their peers? <clears throat> Our policy is not to send work because it's almost impossible to replicate whole group instruction or small group instruction for, with family members far away from, from school. Mm -hmm. You know, the turn and talk, the pairs, the pair work, the, just the small group work, you can't replicate that somewhere else. Um, we ask them to keep a journal of what they eat, who they visit with, what they see, where they go, because those are the enriching experiences that they want to remember and share mm -hmm. when they come back. We ask them to read books. We ask them to, you know, write letters back to say what you're doing. So we ask them to do some things, but we really don't give them a packet of work because, quite honestly, oftentimes we don't know they're leaving with a lot of notice. Mm -hmm. So asking a teacher to suddenly get six weeks worth of work ahead of time is not and it reasonable would be, <laughs> and, and realistic. And so, yeah, and it's just, it's just impossible to replicate that. So then when they come back, we try to catch them up our instructional coaches or our academic support folks when they meet with them and sort of fill them in on some of the key things that they might have missed, especially like in the math curriculum. <laughs> I was gonna say it can be a little counterproductive to send six weeks worth of math work that they attempt to do incorrectly and mm -hmm. it causes frustration and actually sets them back further than okay. had they not, you know, attempted to struggle through it. Or try to do it all in like two days. Right, back, right. Oh, right. we're on the plane back quick. <laughs> I think it was a great point that you made about having the attendance report attached to the mm -hmm. communication with the family because I don't think people realize the impact of being out one or two days a month that's two to four weeks yeah. of school over the year. And, it's, and so it, it would shed a different perspective when they took a look at it like that. Well, I think about all the kids that do travel sports and vacations. And yeah. so we have sort of the kids that are struggling and missing school. And then we may have the kids that have the benefit of, of additional um, opportunities that may be impacting them. And it, and it may not be a consideration parents until they see and I think them. thinking about that too with also the stress and anxiety level our kids are very verbally expressing and clearly expressing in a lot of um, different ways if not just verbally but behaviorally and does that have an impact is there any correlation or causation between those two things um, that's something we need to look really close that, at. that's actually um, ties into one of my questions and that's how you're gathering that information um, because I wonder you know, if it's a parent, if they're going to feel comfortable sharing it, and if it's a child giving that information, how, you know, how they provide that information. So, do you mean about why they're absent? Yeah, why they're, they're absent. So, how do you parent. gather that? Yeah. It's yeah. a so yeah. What we did was we actually tried to standardize it so that the secretaries across the district are asking things in a consistent way. Um, and if you take a look at um, the, the way that the truancy laws are written, like there are different categories of excused absences. And so that is exactly what we're focusing on, right? So if somebody says we're on a vacation, then it's a vacation. If it's a medical appointment that gets, um, you know, logged in for that. If it's, um, you know, an emergency family event, that's a different category. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I know I hear my receptionist asking folks, um, you know, at the middle school and I, and I think people are pretty comfortable in saying, you know, like she'll just say, oh, can I ask why he's out today? And a parent will, you know, disclose that. I, it's, it's really not even within um, something that I remember that parents were like, it's none of your business, mm -hmm. right? But I think it is parents so reported. I was going to yeah. say, I yeah. might say, oh, he's not feeling well today, thank you, and get off the phone and then be like, put on your swimsuit, kid. Like, <laughs> yes, we have I to. would never personally do that. <laughs> yeah. you know, but I think that's where we have to like assume right. positive intent. Yeah, yeah I was going to say our norm <laughs> working in the same direction to support students. Of it's never going to be perfect, but yeah. it's better than absent. Unexcused yeah. Right. Absent. And as you know, that it's it's very complicated because what anxiety looks like in a little one or mm -hmm. even a big one is, you know, I've got a tummy ache or mm -hmm. I've got a headache, right? And so there's a lot of layers of doing the due diligence at school and supporting them and having those caring adults and just looking a little more deeply at that. And that takes a whole team mm -hmm. approach. I, I've, I've seen a lot of communication about the 
chronic absenteeism, but I haven't seen much communication about the data collection. And so I just think for myself, I might respond. I, I might care a little bit more about those questions if I understood why. And that's part of the rollout is next year. We haven't changed the coding system yet okay. in a formal way. So I think that, that when we send a letter and talk about atten why attendance matters, maybe with a flyer or something next year, that's what we can get the next and, and I think it would be helpful, too, for parents to know what those categories are whenever you define them because... Like, I called the other day, and I said, Grace won't be in today. And they said, oh, is it a medical appointment? <laughs> and I was like, um, yeah, sure. I mean, it was like an orthodontist appointment or something. So if I knew that you were coding it, I mm -hmm. probably would take the time to be like, hey, Grace is out. She's she's out for a medical appointment. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah giving that like, it's common the, language. It's the exactly. categories that is are in our policy for right. excused right. But absence. when you talk about, like, even in your procedures at the beginning of the year, like, you know, here's what to do when your kid is sick. You can call and here's all the reason, you know, here's our codes for why kids might be out. Or, yeah, that would be good to put into our communications. And I think another thing that the, t the committee, the Attendance and Truancy Committee has been talking about is how do we welcome students back mm -hmm. after they've been out? Mm -hmm. right. So um, instead of being like, where have you been? You know, yeah. wow, we really missed you. We're so glad you're here. And a, a lot of our teachers already do that. And so that's a way for us to say, here's a, a really good practice that's... And also, want. how do we acknowledge when they're making improvements, right? right. So yeah. we had... Mm -hmm. Some students who were having some attendance issues, and again, in planning with the family and figuring out what were the interventions that needed to be put in place, then we saw that, um, you know, the families had um, really improved in the ability to get the student to school, and I sent emails to students and to their parents, right, in those cases, because we, you know, have ongoing checks of that data. And the feedback that I got from a couple of parents was just like unbelievable, like, wow, thank you for noticing, mm -hmm. you know. But again, that's how we keep people coming back and, and seeing that we really do all want to be one team and supportive. Mm -hmm. Have, you've been waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you all discussed strategies for the K-5 level where we don't have power school? Because mm -hmm. this is a foreign concept mm -hmm. to those of us who do not yet have a middle school student. So in terms of being able to code it on your end, I think that that's extremely valuable. But there's no access for parents yet. at the K-5 mm -hmm. level yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a, a, a nice handout that I've seen from Count Me In where it's for a parent and it says, has some data and it has the nine days because mm -hmm. what research has shown is that achievement isn't really affected until you miss more than nine days. So it's for a parent to keep track themselves mm -hmm. of the nine days you know, of every time they're absent, just so you know. Right. I mean, because quite, I mean, just <laughs> speaking from personal experience, you know, Ben's report card came home and I looked at it and said, oh, he only had one absence. Like, I don't, yeah. I, we're busy and like, right. I, but like, I was like, oh, he only missed one day this trimester. Like, I would have thought in my mind that it was more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think those days add up quickly for a lot of parents. That's exactly what the letter, know. that's what our letter says. Yeah. But that's a little reactive, right? When it has become a problem, the letter's right. like, quite often these absences add up without right. anybody recognizing. So just bringing it to your attention, you know, it's X many days. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like the first letter, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a progression um, mm -hmm. from there. And so we do have it like in our handbook and those types of things. But I think that maybe we could do a better job highlighting that in the beginning of the year and being more proactive about, um, you know, how those absences impact, especially, I think, the little ones, yeah. because it's hard to replicate. And I think that there's, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, you know, oh, well, it's it's just first grade, like, they'll be okay. But a lot happens in a day. Yeah. A lot happens. Including the habit of coming to school. And, and, and that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And I think it's pretty mind-blowing to think mm -hmm. one day a month you think, well, that's that's pretty good attendance, right? You only miss one day a month, but that leads that's to chronic absenteeism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One is okay, but two... 
know because you only have to get 10. I think yeah. that reminder over the course of the year, I think, mm -hmm. is important because it is easy to lose sight of the absences. Mm -hmm. And then you look and you're like, oh my goodness, they've been out seven times and it's April. Yeah. So yeah. like just kind of shifting that mindset about what does it mean to be chronically absent and, and just communicating that more often throughout the year, I think, would be helpful in a positive way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, yeah. I think we try to be very um, positive about it. It's not, where is your child? It's, you know, are they okay? Because mm -hmm. it's a lot of times it's just about safety and are, and are they somewhere where they're supposed to be and does someone know they're not here? So at different age levels, obviously, that's, that's different. But when we can't reach a parent at our level, that's concerning because... Mm -hmm. You know, if your child comes to school and is sick and we can't reach you, what you know, where do we go from there? It's different than older children who have a little bit more ability to tell you different phone numbers or different, you know, situations that are going on. So, you know, we really did a lot of work trying to just get ourselves um, coordinated and calibrated and and thinking about it the same way. And it was fascinating to say, like, well, in the state law or power school, I'm not even sure where the the origin of it was, was, you know, if you miss three hours, if you're three hours late, that's an absence, not a tardy, you know, <laughs> and those kinds of things. Like, where does that line, where does it cross the line? Because we'll have kids that come in an hour late and leave two hours early because they just happen to have appointments or whatever, you know, depends. And is that a full day of attendance or is that only a part? It, you know, so there's learning all of those nuances and the formulas of it so that we can all be consistent has been really important. Can I ask a question about a different topic? Yes, please. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question about the busing and the start time changes. And um, anecdotally, I'm hearing that there's far more parents K through 8 dropping their kids off at school in the morning. And I'm wondering if, if the principals have seen that in terms of are more parents dropping off, so therefore, therefore maybe the busing isn't a problem because there's not as many kids on the bus in terms of drop-offs. Have, have you seen a difference in that? I have or? not seen necessarily a huge increase in drop-offs. So pretty much status quo, you think? We have a ton parents. of parents who drop off and pick up. Yeah. yeah. They're always I mean, but that's yeah. always been the yeah. case. Right. I would yes. say... Mm -hmm. oh. Uh, I don't have anything to compare it to, but um, <laughs> it was not overwhelming. I mean, it was manageable drop-offs, and it's mm -hmm. you know it's the same parents every morning. So, yeah. I would say that our pickups have increased mm -hmm. at Wentworth because we're getting out a little later, and I think that parents are scrambling to get kids right. to Wherever where they need yeah. to be because at our age they're starting to do extra sports and <laughs> lessons and those sorts of things and dance. Um, but I haven't noticed a big change in drop-offs compared to previous years. Have you done a reassessment at each of your building levels about how the start times are working and whether people are... We've sort of been taking the lead. Has there been a reassessment, I guess? Well, I think like, we've, been, yeah. we've been asked... We, we talk about it on a regular basis, mm -hmm. like how are things going, and I think that K2, we haven't changed our start mm -hmm. times. Right. But technically, right. but officially, our, we have gained time because our kids are actually in the building and where they're supposed to be on time for the mm -hmm. most part. So, um, you know, the kids that come in at 8.55 are now tardy, not just like, right. oh, go on down, it's okay. <laughs> but I know that the, you know, we, so we, I feel like at Eight Corners that we have gained instructional time. We are now able, this coming year, to start our special schedule for art, music, PE, those kinds of things, as early as 9 o'clock, which we were 9.15 this year, because you had to wait to make sure everybody was in and everybody could get in there. In, even in a small school, I can't imagine having to wait for kids to walk to the end of the purple wing and mm -hmm. it went it's pretty far. It's a long way. <laughs> um, so in that regard, I think it's been great. Um, the balance on that is just um, the sort of the, the large number of kids that are there for 10, it's not a long time, but 10 minutes all together, we, we've got to, we, we at Eight Corners need to figure out something better and different for next mm -hmm. year, and we're working on it, but um, it, it, you know, it's, it's great to have everybody where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. What about the schools who have, who change times? Like, I know you guys change we times pretty significantly. Times. So we changed by 15 minutes, so it really has really been pretty insignificant for us. Okay.
So you haven't noticed any difference? Okay. Yeah. It wasn't um, a major change for us in terms of the amount of minutes. It was just a change in the direction that we wouldn't have preferred, I mm -hmm. think, had we had our druthers about it out of right. the gates. That wasn't, you know, it was kind of a late decision and it wasn't what we had expected. Um, but that all being said, there, we've realized a lot of benefits um, in having most of our kids there. At the same time, we are fortunate in our facility that we can accommodate that between recess and the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, the kids have benefited, the early arriving buses have benefited from additional recess time in the morning. So that's great. I think that um, we're really looking forward to having hopefully a fully staffed transportation department next year and that will um, improve things additionally because we have a lot of buses and some of them are shared with eight corners so that was a little tricky on some days but um, for the most part it's been really pretty positive until the construction started on 114 at the end of the school year. So that was noticed stressful. that now that school's out, they're not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was like, Dave the other day. I was like, ra like rain trail going down the nice smooth road. I'm like, I was going to say, Rick one took care of that. So I guess it sounds to me like the, the time itself didn't make as much of a difference as the fact that everybody was there and ready to learn at the actual start of school. Is that so I guess my question is to do a reassessment like, you know, we made a change and I feel like it's our responsibility to reassess that change and see how it's going for everyone. Is that a directive that we would give? <laughs> Or is that something that just happens like on a regular basis at the end of the year, you guys reassess how everything's going? That's my question. So I guess that depends on what you mean by reassess. If you're talking community survey. Um, I guess I'm talking about more than just anecdotal, like, oh, I've heard a few teachers say that this works better for them. Yeah. So I'm talking I mean, about like some data that we can well, look at, I guess. So then you could look at... Could you look at attendance, attendance data? data? You could look like, at yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 Breakfast yeah. sales. You Breakfast sales, you could look at, could look at that all of our K-2 schools start on time because yeah. I haven't had one K-2 principal call me this year complaining. Mm -hmm. The kids are getting here at 9.10. Do you know the bus came in at 9.20? It was, the, you know, it's a half hour late. None of that has happened this year. None. They all are there. So the instructional time... I mean, it might be handled over, but the instructional time, it's if you looked at how many, over the course of a week, how many so minutes much. did the K-2 gain over the course of a week of instructional time for the kids? Yeah, wow. absolutely. What about yeah, so I don't, I don't think I, But I guess I'm looking to, to talk to, to hear from teachers and parents, because that's who we heard from when we made the change. Do you know what I... Well, I mean, maybe I'm so off. I think no, I'm, I, 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 agree. I agree with you. So the survey that we gave was about the proposed change. So right. I think the issue that we have right now is that you don't have baseline data. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and collect baseline data, but we okay. don't really have baseline data. Okay, well then that's what um, we need to do. I would think. And but we do have um, we do have data from the beginning of the year, the mid year, and the end of the year on multiple data points, such as instructional mm -hmm. time, such as breakfast sales, such as. Um, number of bus runs, you know, those types of things. So maybe this is a different meeting then, but I think it would be really interesting for us to see that data, like, side by side, yeah. and then maybe from there talk about how we want to access some feedback from community and parents. Mm -hmm. I think that should be that's another a, workshop That's probably session. a separate meeting. Yeah, yeah, you might, it might be, one recommendation I might make is maybe putting together, like, an overview of pre-change, post-change, right. kind of on certain data points that you think will be valuable mm -hmm. to the community and then asking for specific feedback. Because the reality is the school that had the biggest time change was Wentworth. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the change for us after the compromise wasn't so much about the, the benefits, the medical I benefits agree. of yep. changing the start times. It was more about the efficiency of the two runs. Right. Mm -hmm. Because at the high school, students are getting there at the same time, pretty much. Um, so... Only if you're if you're a student who drives yourself or your parent drops you off, you might be realizing a benefit from the change in the start time. But for kids who ride the bus, they're not. There's able no to, change. They're getting like, there. They're getting there. Yeah. I also think it's important to be cautious and to understand that this was year one of a change. Mm -hmm. I'm not and looking to change it. No, no, I know again, that. But I, just I, I think I think even, I think I think even like how we approach getting that data, which I think is very important to get. Um, I think there's something to be said for um, year two being a really good year to do that work 
rather than trying to evaluate year one when there were some wrinkles that might still be fresh in people's minds that mm -hmm. might skew um, how they might report out on stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just think, I mean, I think it's good to let something evolve over more than one school year before we... Yeah, I agree. And know that there will be wrinkles in September again. Mm -hmm. What's that? There yeah. will be wrinkles in September again. There are Oh, for September. sure. <laughs> September is probably not a great, great time to evaluate yeah. anything in education. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have, a, I, have one more, <laughs> I have one more question I wanted to bring up, and I'm so, I missed the very beginning bit of this, so it might not be relevant, but um, I was wondering if there's been any work done or if there are plans to do any work about, um, um, I know we can't do a district homework policy, but some consistency in homework across the, I guess, at least phase levels. Um, just anecdotally, like I remember when Grace was at Eight Corners, some kids had homework, some kids didn't. Now, no, I think, I think it's like a no homework policy. Wentworth, I feel like some kids have like two hours a night, and other kids have never have any ever. Mm -hmm. And I just been, I've been doing a lot of reading on whether homework is in fact beneficial, other than mm -hmm. like reading and math fluency. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's going to, if there's any work being done on that like topic. So and I assume that would be phase level, right? Because, I mean, what's well, good for no. high school isn't Two things. For you could have a homework policy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you could choose to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the second piece is I think that fits in with the values conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we, we, we talked about in the beginning, Hillary, before you came. I think okay. that really Sorry. is some big work we need to do. Like, what is learning? Do we have a common definition right. of learning? Like, what is homework? Why do we give homework? How much... Do we get, you know, what I is think the that's, value of it? And there is a guideline, but it's not a policy, right? That 10 minutes mm -hmm. per grade. Mm -hmm. per, so, yeah. like, if right. you're in fifth right. grade, 50 that minutes. Not um, that's like, it's been not homework for fifth grade. And, and then it goes to soccer and, and then dance. And, and do people so include so their reading time in that 50 right. minutes, or is that right. above and beyond? So, I think that there is a lot of consistency. So, I guess I'm just curious, though, because I feel like a board level policy is taking away a lot of the. Expertise that you guys have, even if we checked with you, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't want to go in and tell a teacher how to teach. So, I guess I'm wondering what the mm, the middle ground is between that and and having a little bit more consistency for families. Yeah, but that sounds like that might be a separate conversation. Also, <laughs> sorry, Alicia. Oh, that's good. Wait, I, my question was for Diane about the. I think the next steps was about reassessments mm -hmm. and, and what that means. Are you Were you saying that um, currently students are able to retake tests and, and quizzes? Is that... Right. That was one of the outcomes of last year's work. And so one of the things that has come up this year is, um, and again, it was more prevalent in the teacher surveys, was, for example, if a student got a 90 on an assessment or a 95. Um, they still really wanted that 100, and so they would be going back to see a teacher during RISE um, to be able to reassess. Um, and from a teacher standpoint, that, that didn't necessarily always feel like a real need to reassess if a student is able to demonstrate that they have the crux of the body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one last question about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, when it showed the grading system and there's a very large discrepancy between how happy the parents are and how happy the teachers are, is that because we're sometimes harder on ourselves or is there something that we can do to increase uh, the level of satisfaction with the teachers and the grading policy, the grading practices in the system. So I think part of that had to do with the fact that it was a significant change for the teachers again, right? And so um, they were sitting in the seat of, you know, being on that front line of here's another change that I need to become accustomed to and figure out, right? And so I think it will be interesting, um, you know, in year two, um, how does that kind of flesh itself out? Gotcha. Well, plus I was thinking, is it statistically significant? I mean, it was a, right. there was a it difference, like, like a, you know. Well, thank you to you guys yes, for doing so much. This was great. It was interesting. It was All great right. work. Thank you.